I don't know. I, I just feel like there's, there's a few changes coming in this body as far as, you know, I felt like the Lord says he's moving us to new levels, newer levels of trust. Yeah. Right? Trusting him and um, trusting the Holy Spirit within each and every one of us yeah. to bring it forth. And I'm glad that Deanne responded to the Holy Spirit. Okay? And came up and brought that word. You know why? Because we need that word she brought. That's it, right? And if there's a word in you that, that God has um, moved in you about and wants you to... It's already on. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's being recorded. And if there's a word that, that the Lord is stirring in you or... You know, it's just like Bible study the other night. You know, I, this, I, I saw, I don't know if you guys that were there witnessed this, but I saw the gifts of the Spirit moving more freely in the body, right? Joey saw a picture, a prophetic picture, uh, and gave that word, right? And how the Lord was moving in a situation, and I thank you for that. I see that, and I bear witness with that, that that was the Holy Spirit and a prophetic gifting that the Holy Spirit, as he wills, not as we will, but as he wills, moves in us. Amen? We're just called to relax in him, rest confidently in him, and trust his lead. That's it. So <clears throat> we want to uh, allow that. We want uh, to, to give room for that in this church. For the Holy Spirit to work through you. If you feel, and I, I saw it, I saw someone move during the worship service and move to someone else and pray for someone maybe or whatever. That's what we're talking about, right? Amen. You know, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And don't listen to that little voice that says, well, well, well is this the Lord? No. If, if, listen, if the Lord is moving you to go over and pray for someone, it's probably the Lord. <laughs> I don't think it's the devil. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> so we want to start giving room for that. And, and we do, you know, at the, towards the end of the service even, we've done that and I just want you to know where I'm at with it. Yeah. I'm not upset or bothered if someone says, I have a word, and we've, we've done that. Beulah's done that. And I want y'all to be confident in that. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> Praise God. And it could be a, a testimony, you know, or something that, even something that you have witnessed the Lord do this past week or whatever, that you feel like would bring an encouragement to the body. Right? Yeah. And so, I'm just, I mean, and you know how you can know things intellectually. We know a lot of things <laughs> intellectually. Yeah. But God wants us to begin to know these things intimately by the Spirit. Right? Yeah. Because we really are in a relationship. It's, it's not about religion. It's not about a meeting. It's not about just reading scripture or me preaching a sermon. No. I really don't want to preach a sermon, to be honest. No. I just want to speak whatever the Holy Spirit lays on my heart to speak. Yeah. For such a time as this. And I, I tell you, with me, all through the week, I get uploads all through the week. Pages. I write stuff down. Mm -hmm. But inevitably, on Sunday, it's like I got nothing. I'm saying, what's up with this? <laughs> I had so much good stuff to share. But all of that is me uh, learning to be that son. Right. The sonship. Right. right? To follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because he knows what y'all need. I don't. Right. Amen? Yeah. And I'm not here to just boast about what God has given me. I'm here to... And I thought about it. You know, Jesus told Peter, he said, feed my sheep. And that's what the call is, you know, but he's the one that gives the food. Right. With me, I got nothing to give <laughs> apart from him. Amen. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And it's and I, I see how the, the Apostle Paul, he really had to learn this. He had to be persuaded in his heart 
about a lot of things because as far as a Pharisee, he was at the top of his class. Amen. As far as morality, he was probably a pretty moral guy on the outside. I mean, the inside was always full of dead men's bones. <laughs> Like Jesus said, you may clean the outside of the cup, but I know what's really going on in the inside of you because until you believe the truth, you'll never be free. The way we're free is not through self-willpower, but it's believing the, and knowing the truth. Amen? And we're set free by that truth and beholding the, the love of our Father and beholding who God has called us to behold. But he was at the top of his class, I'm sure, as far as intellectually, he was, he was probably a well-spoken well, uh, person, okay, could debate with the best Pharisee in the house, because that's really what it was mostly all about, was about uh, debating who was right and who was wrong. <laughs> kind of sounds like the church sometimes, doesn't it? And it can be like that, and it has like that a lot in a lot of the church. You know why? Because when you move, when you lean more to your own understanding and to your own intellect, and you're led more by the carnal than you are by the spirit, the only thing left you've got is well, the fruit of that is going to be argument, debate, division. You know, the, all the things we a lot of times see. The Apostle Paul, he says, this is because you're carnal. <laughs> In other words, you're operating out of your own understanding, your own intellect, instead of operating from the mind of Christ, the mind of the Spirit. And that's what I'm saying, that, that the Apostle Paul learned a lot better way, amen, called the way of the Spirit, right, with his encounter with Jesus on that road to Damascus. How many of you know he was blinded? By, blinded by the light <laughs> blinded but you know later on he was healed I like this on a street called straight I think it was I just love God's sense of humor we're going to straighten some things out in Paul on a street called straight and he sent a man over there and listen I don't know all the names of these people who was it I don't know ain't nice went over there, and his eyes were like, there were scales, like scales on his eyes that fell off. And he began to see, okay? And I, I believe that, and I know, I know this to be true, that he not only began to see physically, but he began to see spiritually. His eyes, not only was his physical eyes open, but his spiritual eyes were open. How do I know that? Because right after that, it says he went immediately in the temple and preached Jesus. Are y'all with me? That's what it says. And you don't do that being a Pharisee that was at one point killing Christians for their faith in Jesus. And the next minute, you're in the temple preaching Jesus. Something has happened on the inside of him. Amen? And this same, same, same something that happened on the inside of Paul, God is doing on the inside of us. He continues to remove the veils. Amen? Scales, veils, whatever you want to call it. Helping us to see and understand what we've been blind to. I mean, it wasn't too long ago we didn't even know that righteousness was a gift from God. Are y'all with me? It was like, we, when we saw that, we thought, wow. Right? And how did we see that? We saw it by the Holy Spirit. Amen? The word preached, the gospel, we heard the words, the good news, and the word with the good news opened up our eyes to see what was there all the time. We say, is this the same Bible? that I've had for the last 30 years, it just, it looks different. I'm seeing, how many of you know what I'm talking about? It's, you're seeing things in there that you didn't see before. But it was there all the time. It's just that we were blind to what it was, just like 
Saul or Paul was blind to the truth. And so many still today, right? In Christianity, we're not saying they're not saved, don't have Jesus in them, but many are still have blinders on, right? They still don't see. But guess what? We don't kick the blind, we help the blind. We don't despise the blind. Lord, help us. <laughs> Jesus came to open up the eyes of the blind. Amen? And so, you know, one thing that, the, that, that Saul, or Apostle Paul said, um, he made a statement, and he said this. He says, I'm a chief sinner. I was the chief sinner. And the Apostle Paul didn't say he was the chief sinner because he was the chief drinker, chief cusser, chief adulterer. Are you with me? It wasn't, he wasn't saying he was a chief sinner because of bad behavior. I want you to get that in, in your understanding. Because a lot of the church has made it all about bad behavior or good behavior. Check, check. Okay. Boom. So the Apostle Paul didn't call himself chief sinner because he was chief smoker, drinker, whatever, adulterer. It's not, it's never been about the bad or good behavior. It's never been about behavior. All right? He called himself chief sinner because he was blind. He was chief at trusting his own strength and flesh for righteousness and life. And he did it with all his zeal. And he could relate to those in Romans 10 that says, I know what they're doing. They're trying to establish their own righteousness by the, their own self-effort. They have a zeal for God, but apart from knowledge. And I would give any, basically he said, I'd give anything for them to see what I'm seeing. That righteousness is a gift to be received. Life is a gift from God. Amen? That is not to ever be achieved, but only received as a gift. And many say, well, why, why does so many have a problem with grace? Have you noticed that a lot of people have a problem with grace? I mean, they even uh, call it nasty names, like Greasy Grace, Sloppy Agape. And how many know that's the carnal mind? And that's the flesh. And why does the flesh is so opposed to grace? I'll tell you why. Because grace takes away all bragging rights of the flesh. It takes all glory away from the flesh. So now you can no longer say, it's Jesus. Glory be to Jesus and me. <laughs> nope, it's glory be to God in the highest. <laughs> Amen? He has saved us. Amen? He delivered us. And now it's about just believing what Jesus has already accomplished once and for all for us. That's the gospel. Amen? Amen? When he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he was risen, we were risen with him as a new creation in Christ. And it's only the Holy Spirit that can make this reality, which is your new reality in Christ. If anyone's a new creation, amen? If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And all things are of God. All things are of God. 
That means all things are of God. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. Amen? And how do we see it? We can only see it, be enlightened to it, through the gospel and the spirit of, of the living God. That's it. And he says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who's persuaded to believe it. Now, if in people's heart they say, well, I, I just don't believe it's just Jesus. Okay, I don't believe it's just Jesus, but it's Jesus plus my tithe. It's plus my church attendance. Are you all with me? It's plus what I do. Am I living the Christian life? <laughs> Lord, help us. How many you know that? How many you know? I'm going to blow your mind. How many you know that God isn't even a Christian? <laughs> How many you know Jesus never came to live the Christian life? That's, that was born from the carnal imagination of man. The flesh that, that wants to do the switch from what Jesus has accomplished down to me living the Christian life. And what I'm going to get rewarded for living the Christian life. I mean, you know, it's not about you living the Christian life, but it's about Christ now living in you. Right? Just like Paul says, he says this, he, he came to the illumination of that by the Spirit, through the gospel. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He was awakened to a new way that was a lot more powerful than his flesh. What his flesh could ever accomplish. Right? And it's called newness of life. It's called the way of the spirit. It's called a mind set on the spirit of life. Will set you free from the law of sin and death. Because you're not, not living now by your strength. And your willpower. And your determination. But you're living by the life of another. The life of Christ. And have you know, and I've said this before, but Christ was not Jesus' last name. <laughs> Christ means anointed, the anointing. It's the, 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 the Holy Spirit anointing. How I many you know the same, I can say this, the same Christ that was in, because we just said it. Paul saw it. The same Christ that was in Jesus is now in you. Christ lives in me. Right? But Christ becomes of no effect if I don't look to Christ. Right? To live in me and through me. If I'm still looking and I have a mindset on my own fleshly willpower and self-determination to live for God, guess what? Christ becomes of no effect. And you're back on the treadmill. The good news is, if you're a believer, he that has the Son has the life, right? That Christ is in you. He is your new reality. You're in union with him. Okay? I like what Greg said one time. He says, Jesus isn't a little bobblehead doll that lives inside of you. You have the, we have the fullness, listen, we have the fullness of God in us. The same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus is in you. I speak this word to persuade our hearts to actually believe it. Right? Because the more we believe it, the more, listen, the more we believe it, the more our hearts are persuaded to believe this truth, the more you're going to experience the life of God, the fullness of God, 
Everyone say experience. experience. The peace of God. Experience the joy of God. The same peace that Jesus says, I'm not giving you a peace like the world gives you that's con- conditioned on how things are going in the world or in the government or whatever. No, this peace I'm giving you is the very peace that comes from the Holy Spirit that cannot be shaken no matter if one nails you to a cross. Are you all with me? That's the kind of peace. That's the joy. The joy and the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the kingdom of God is righteousness, right? Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And we've been talking about this. The Holy Spirit's been showing this to us that before we can experience real peace and joy, we need to understand the righteousness of God. And to me, the righteousness of God is seeing God, number one, for who he really is. He is righteous. That doesn't mean he's in a bad mood. That doesn't mean he's too holy to look at a worm like you. (laughs) How we've defined it, right? That doesn't mean, well, God's righteous and God's just. I mean, we've painted this picture of God like he's some kind of ogre judge with black robes that is, I mean, he can hardly even look at us because of our behavior. Are you with me? That's not what righteousness is. Righteousness is really the state of God as he is. First of all, the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? The righteousness of God is this, that he saw us not in bad behavior or good behavior. He saw us in union with sin and death through one man, Adam. Read it, Romans 5. And death began to reign over the entire world. He saw us in not, it wasn't, and people get upset when I say this sometimes, certain people, not y'all. It was never been about bad behavior, but a bad marriage. A bad union. Called the old man. Everyone say the old man. (laughs) Romans 6 talks about the old man. That we were in union with. And Jesus came. Jesus came. The word became flesh. To divorce us. From that old man. That old union in Adam. Right? Put to death the old man. So that we could be then. United to him. Who was raised from the dead. I mean you know that was. Accomplished. Are y'all with me? David Hawkins, he uh, he always sends me little things sometimes, and he did this morning, and I don't know if I can find it, but the thing that came to me because he was talking about, he was actually talking about how that Jesus didn't come. How I mean, you know Jesus didn't come to reform the old man? He came to kill him. <laughs> Right? He didn't come to uh, modify his behavior. Christian modification behavior. Behavior modification, right? And that's what, listen, I'm saying these things because a lot of Christians are still on the treadmill of trying to modify their behavior. And they're blind to the gospel of what really took place. He didn't come to, to reform the old man. He came to kill him. And the thing that came into my spirit was a lot of people, and you've heard him say this, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a very popular saying. And what you're saying is that you're still married to the old man. That what Christ did at the cross didn't work. You're still in union with the old man. That Jesus 
in his body was put to death once and for all. Never to be resurrected again. <laughs> right? So many are living in, in, in a delusion still. And not in the reality of the new creation. Of who they are in their union with God. Right? And I say it's, it's, it's more, there, it's just like Lazarus when he was raised from the dead. Of course, he was resuscitated because he died again. And you know, there was only one that was resurrected from the dead that has never died again. And his name is Jesus. But Lazarus was resuscitated, given a few more years. But when he came out, he came out with grave clothes on. Right? And he said, Jesus said, loose him, take his grave clothes off and set him free. He's talking to the community of, believer, of people that were there to take those grave clothes. And what's going on is a lot of Christians, even though they've been raised, resurrected into new life, they're still identifying more with the grave clothes of the old man, which is the old thought system, old belief system. Right? Old persuasion. And we, through the word, as a community, God is calling us through the preaching of the gospel, the truth, to see those grave clothes removed. Amen? So now that people never don't identify with the old man, but the reality, they begin to walk in the reality of the new creation that God has already created them to be in Jesus. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. Amen? And we've said this before, but, you know, the n number one theft in America or in the world is identity theft. The number one theft in the church today is also identity theft. People simply don't know who they are in Jesus and what God has already accomplished in Christ. Amen? The Apostle Paul came into great revelation. We can see it throughout his letters, right? He understood the gospel. He defended the gospel, right? And he manifested what he believed. He, began, he was bearing the fruit of what he actually believed as a new creation in Christ. He began to live from that, that life that was in him, that Christ life. And the manifestation of that, we see it, is the wisdom of the Spirit, the demonstration of the Spirit, right? He began to, to walk and speak in an authority that was way beyond his own even fleshly ability. Amen? And how many know that's what we've been called to? Each and every one of us, I don't care what the gifting is. Now, we haven't been all called to, to be evangelists, pastors, teachers. But we're the body of Christ. Amen? And as the body of Christ, we've all been given the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we are all called to look, rely on the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's called being a normal human being. In him we live and move and have our being. Right? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. How many of you know that a lot of our, well, all divisions come from one place? It comes from, really, opinions debates. I mean, you know, everyone's got an opinion. <laughs> I mean, even the world knows that, right? Everyone's got an opinion. And I'm just saying this, and, and I've been on this because I feel like the Lord has been really wanting me to emphasize that, listen, you can know the scripture, you can read the scripture, but apart from the Holy Spirit, you will never understand the word. Don't get quiet on me. You're not that smart. <laughs> I don't care how many words you can break down in the Greek and Hebrew. Are you all with me? Yeah. 
I'm saying without the Holy Spirit, he is the illuminator. He is the one that gives us eyes to see. Amen. And without the Holy Spirit, we can come up with all kind of carnal conclusions and interpretations of what things are. And listen, when I look around and I hear all the different beliefs in Christianity, it just makes me dizzy. Are you all with me? It's like, my goodness. And what it's doing for me is causing me to, to lean more on the Holy Spirit and less on my own intellect and less on the opinion of man. Or even if it's a good preacher, yeah, praise God, good preacher, dynamic. But Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Amen? So Paul learned this. And he's Second Peter 1, 20 through 21. He says this. I love the passion, how it reads here. It says, you must understand this at the outset. Are you all with me? Interpretation of scripture prophecy requires the Holy Spirit. For it does not originate from someone's own imagination. No, pro- no true prophecy comes from human initiative. But it's inspired by the moving of the Holy Spirit upon those who spoke the message that came from God. The scripture was written as they were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the scripture. Guess what? It takes the Holy Spirit to understand the scripture. Amen. So who needs to be the ultimate teacher here? Is it me? No. I would never encourage that. Ever. In fact, I've always encouraged, no matter what I say, you take it to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because ultimately the Holy Spirit is the one that gives the illumination, gives us the understanding, gives us eyes to see what's really being said. In 2 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6, and this is what I'm seeing is Paul. All of them were like, they were, they were pointing to the Holy Spirit. As far as if, if any ministry is going to take place, if any words of wisdom are going to happen, if, any, if anyone's going to really be set free, it's going to be through the preaching of the gospel and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit with power. And Paul had to to really set his mind to this. Because, like I said, he was probably in the flesh. He was very capable in many ways above his counterpeers. Right? Top of his class. But 2 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6. And I love how the Passion puts out, put, uh, writes this. I know it's going to read a little bit different in yours. But I really feel like they capture this with the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. He says this. Paul says, we don't see ourselves as capable enough to do anything. Here's the chief Pharisee that was very confident in the flesh. Saying now, we don't see ourselves as capable enough to do anything. (laughs) Glory to God. (laughs) In our own strength. For our competence flows from God's empowering presence. He alone makes us adequate ministers who are focused on an entirely new covenant. Our ministry is not based on the letter of the law, but through the power of the Spirit. The letter of the law kills, but the Spirit pours out life. (laughs) You see, his emphasis was not on the flesh, but it was in the spirit and it wasn't listen you need to understand it wasn't just a new message but it was it was the message it was the truth it wasn't just the letter it wasn't just how many know a lot of people boast in the that they're no longer under the new covenant but they're under the or the old covenant but under the new covenant and yet they're still powerless I mean, you know, if you take the new letter, amen, it can just be as dead as the old without the Holy Spirit. 
How many know what makes the word alive? In us, to us, and through us is not our intellect, our understanding, but it's the spirit. That's what I'm trying to get at. Amen? So we go to, we send people to seminaries to learn all these things, and sometimes they call them cemeteries. <laughs> to get very intellectual. I know the Greek. I know the Hebrew. I know this. I know that. I even know how to get up and speak eloquently. But without the Holy Spirit, you're as dead as a doornail. Amen? There is a natural charisma that people have. Don't think that that is the Holy Spirit. Natural charisma cannot take place, take the place of the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. But I'm seeing that a lot of people are, are deceived by eloquent speech and natural charisma. Amen? Yeah. They even boast in it. Not even understanding that there is no power, no anointing behind it. In 2 Corinthians 3, 13 through 18, he says, Paul says, We are not like Moses who used a veil to hide the glory to keep the Israelites from staring at him as it faded away. <laughs> I'm so glad that we have a glory that is not fading away. Are y'all with me? Yeah. I was just reading this. It was in Isaiah, I think it's 9. It says, and the government and the increase of his government is on his shoulders. And the increase of this government, there will be no end. We are not on the decrease. We are on the increase. No matter what's going on or what you see around, don't ever be fooled by the boast of Goliath. Don't ever be intimidated by a, a, the boast of Goliath, which I call the boast of death. Death is on its way out. Corruption is on its final end. Death is on death row. And it says in Isaiah 9, he says, the zeal of the Lord will perform this. So I don't care what you see going on around you. Amen. The glory of the Lord is what's on the increase. Amen. Amen. And when I say increase, I'm talking about their full, fuller manifestation of this glory. He says this, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters do the sea. <laughs> I'm excited. Amen. People say, don't you care about all the evil in the world? Well, it's not like, um, you know, I'm, I'm ignorant of what things going on. But like you said, someone says, I think it's more evil today than it's ever been. Well, you don't understand when this was written, they were throwing people to lions. Yeah. Yeah. And they would bring out the whole family. Yeah. Popcorn, hot dog. I mean, they'd sit there. Instead of football, they're watching people torn to shreds yeah. and enjoying it. I mean, can you imagine, even imagine something like that today? I mean, I think the glory of God is on the increase. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. So we don't need to be startled by that because, listen, God has not, I'll speak like Paul spoke to them when they began to get startled. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. He says, their minds were closed and hardened, for even to this day that same veil comes over their minds when they hear the words of the former covenant. The veil has not yet been lifted from them, for it is only eliminated when one is joined to the Messiah. I mean, no, the veil of the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom when Jesus died and said it's finished. But religion came and sewed it back up. In the hearts of people. Not literally. But it really did. I mean, it's just like... And Paul saw this. He saw this veil being sewn back up in the hearts of people. 
That's why he's addressing that. He, he knows. He's been there. Done that. Bought many t-shirts. He knows that the way of life has been made completely open to everyone to come. Amen. And receive that life. But he says the moment one turns to the Lord. We've been on this and I, I love this. Because it's really emphasizing your relationship with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, and listen, with the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen? Holy Spirit. Amen. The moment one turns to the Lord with an open heart, here's my heart, Lord. That's why, man, I was having a time with that song because I just said, the, the, and it's the Holy Spirit just saying, yes. That's what it really means to give your heart to the Lord. Amen. Let him be the main influence of what you believe. Amen. Because as a man believes in his heart, so is he. Why not be the, let, allow the Holy Spirit to be the main influence of your heart? Right? That leads to life. The one moment one turns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil is lifted. And they say, you see where seeing comes? Where blindness goes? And you begin to see things even in the scripture that you never saw before? And you begin to see things in people that you never saw before? And you begin to judge people in a different way? Not according to the flesh. Right? but according to the very heart of God. Guess what? You take on the very heart of the Lord. You begin to express the very heart of God. Amen? Just like Jesus came, the Word became flesh, and he, what he did was put the heart of the Father on full display for us to see. Now the Lord I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit. And wherever he is Lord, there is freedom. I struggled with that at first. <laughs> but how many know it's okay to struggle, but you take it to the Lord? The struggle even comes with, well, what will other people think if I th see it that way? Are you? I'm just being honest here. It's like, well, I mean, I'm already getting kind of... Uh, well, they got chopped in a couple places. <laughs> chopped. Not invited back. Won't go into detail. But how many of you know, I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit. The traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. I don't care how popular the belief is. Or people say, this is it, and you're a heretic. Listen, I'm following the Holy Spirit's lead. Amen? Y'all do whatever you want, but I'm following the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Isn't that what Jesus said? He basically said, y'all do it. What, what, what are you going to leave too? And what Jesus says, I'm following the Holy Spirit. Because that's where the words of life are. And where the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, where, where He is Lord, there is freedom. It takes me a minute to say that. What we're saying is, you can have the Spirit of the Lord in you, but are you under the influence of that Spirit? We can boast we have Jesus in us. We, have, we can boast we have Christ in us, but is Christ... Lord, is are we under the lordship of the Holy Spirit? Are we under the influence? Right. Yeah. Or is he locked up in there? <laughs> or is he? Yeah. <laughs> I have Jesus in my heart. Yeah. He's supposed to be out here. <laughs> yeah. This is this is really tough on the flesh. There's some things that I'm seeing and hearing that are I kind of, I mean, it's becoming less of a struggle to my flesh. I'm balking at it less than I used to, which I understand it's because the Holy Spirit is doing a work in my heart, a good thing. And he's showing me things about the way of the cross, okay? 
Have you know Jesus, it wasn't just about the work of the cross, but it was the way of the cross. That just Jesus didn't live his own life independently from the Spirit. You guys are getting quiet on me. But it's really, what I see, the way of the cross, it's the way of love. And we're going to get into more detail about this, but it's the way of God. Because God does not live a self-centered life. God does not live. Have you noticed that each one is looking to the other? Right? The Godhead? And not, not any part of that God is, 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 although we've turned God the Father into something he's not through religion. We've made him like this self-centered, egotistical maniac that unless you serve me, you're going to burn in hell forever. That's how we viewed God. Unless you worship me and serve me and are faithful to me. Okay? Then you're in trouble, mister. I mean, you know, that God didn't even create us. He didn't create us. This really goes well with people. (laughs) He didn't create us so that we could serve him. He created us because he, God, who is God, who is, how many know God is not needy or lacking? He's not like, I need someone to worship me. I need someone to pay attention to me. I need someone to uh, serve me, so I need to create some employees. (laughs) This is really tough on the flesh because it's against everything that we've been taught. He created us because he wanted he wanted to share all that he is with us. Amen. That's it. And of his fullness we have received. And in turn, created after the image and likeness of God, God has shared all that he is with us. Now we pour all out all that's in us out to others. We become a reflection of God. Amen. That's called the way yeah. of the cross. You could say the way of love. Yeah, the Lord helped me to see it. The way of the cross is the way of love. And how many know God is love? So it wasn't, listen, we got to get in our understanding that the cross wasn't just about one, a one-time historical event. But the cross is the way of God. It wasn't just the way of the cross. It wasn't just the way of love, but it was, how many know, it was also the work of love. No greater love was demonstrated that he laid his very life down for us. (laughs) It's a challenge to our flesh sometimes because we've been this other way, right? But that's the way of freedom. The Holy Spirit led Jesus to the cross. And to trust his father for life. Amen? And I felt like the Lord spoke to me and says, you know what? Your old life wasn't yours, but neither is your new life. You say that again? Your old life wasn't yours, but neither is your new life. Present yourselves a living. Amen? He says, when he says you're dead to sin, he didn't just say you were dead to sin, because I read it somewhere. We're dead to sin. We're dead to the old man. He said, reckon yourself dead to sin, but alive to God. For your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. But he's not saying that to because he needs someone to control. He's showing us the way of love. I'm telling you, the Lord is, gonna, is doing a work in our heart to, to purge our hearts from, 
from everything that is keeping us from manifesting the pure love of God. I'm preaching to myself when I'm preaching this, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We just need to say, Holy Spirit, have your way in my heart. Amen? Move me to that new center. Away from the self-centeredness. Amen? To the true center that you created me to function from. I'm telling you what, the more revelation we get of God and his nature and who he is, it's just going to blow our minds. I'm talking the God of all creation that created all things. Yet his very nature is that of a servant. You with me? Right before Jesus goes to the cross, he kneels, he takes a towel and a, a basin of water, and he kneels, and he begins to wash their feet. Yes. Right? And he says, if you're calling me Lord, then don't seek any position higher than this. Yes. You know why he's saying that? Because this is where freedom is. Right. This is where true life is. Thank you, Lord. Where he is, he is Lord, there is freedom. We can all draw close to him with the veil removed. I love that. From our faces. I mean, he's our, we're already in union with the Lord, right? But God wants us to experience the Lord. He wants us to see and become intimate with God face to face. Just like they were in the garden, right? Remember when Adam, it says Adam ran from the presence of the Lord, that word presence is face. When he believed the lie, something happened in Adam's heart that caused Adam to run from the face of God. Now God is doing a new thing in a heart that's causing us to draw close to his face yes. Thank you, and walk with him in his presence. Amen? Face to face with him. Because the veil is being removed. Yes. I'm telling you, there's a veil that continues to be removed as we turn to the Holy Spirit. Right. Amen? Yes. And say, Holy Spirit, continue to do a work in my heart. Yes. Remove the veils. And help me to see more clearly. Amen? Don't ever get to a point where you think, and I know none of you here will. I see it all. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> the one who truly was face to face all right, with, with the Father and walk this earth was Jesus. Okay? But with an encouragement to me, and, and we believe the thing of, well, that was Jesus. <laughs> you know, a lot of people believe that word. Well, that was Jesus, and, and that's not me. <laughs> but I'm telling you what, Jesus was the word who became flesh. Everything he did, he did in the same kind of flesh and blood body that we have. He even walked on water. All right? It wasn't through the power of his flesh that he did anything. It was through his face-to-face -face intimate union with the Father. And it went when what was on the inside was, was manifest to the out, the transfiguration... It was in his mortal flesh. Same here. The message we have is not just to be spoken, it's to be seen. But it won't be seen until our hearts are persuaded to believe it. To believe the love that God has for us. To believe God for who he really is. 
And I'm telling you what, this is a small group, but we are well on our way. I can see that. Oh, yeah. Amen? Amen? The veil's being removed. And it says, and with no veil, everyone say no veil. No veil. We all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of Jesus. And we are tran being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. If there's anything I said today, I want your, it said to persuade your heart. This word is spoken to persuade your heart. Amen. Towards the same that Paul was persuaded to. Right? Away from the flesh to the Holy Spirit. He was, I mean, you read this and he, man, this guy was, he was not speaking from uh, some words he learned in cemetery. He was speaking from experience. He was speaking out of what he understood, right? What his heart was persuaded to believe because he says, I'm persuaded about these things. In Romans 8, he says, I'm persuaded that nothing will ever separate me from the love of God. <laughs> he was persuaded about his union with God. He was persuaded about who God really was. And who he was in his father's eyes. And on that persuasion, he began to experience the manifestation of and demonstration of this, of this spirit. Yeah. Amen. Really? Amen? Amen? And it's through this experience, too, that, listen, that, that book, I don't know if any of you have read that, but I just think along my journey of how God, you know, drops the little breadcrumbs. <laughs> Years ago, and this came from a Baptist church, a book called Experiencing God. And I thought, I was drawn to that. I said, that is what God wants for me. He doesn't want me just to know about him. He wants me to experience him. I mean, you know, that's what the world needs. That's what young people need. They don't need to hear this message. You know, it's all manipulation. Fear manipulation. Well, if you don't serve God, you're going to burn in hell forever. Well, that sounds like a great idea. You know, where's my fire insurance? <laughs> God's moving us away from so many things. Thank God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Spirit, Holy Spirit, that we sense in this place today, Lord God, and for your just uh, the faith that keeps persuading our hearts to see, to believe what you believe. Thank you for your love, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. 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 I tell you what, your prayer life becomes more like instead of begging and pleading, it becomes more like, wow, thank you. <laughs> Are we doing communion? No? Okay. Amen. Does anyone else have anything you'd like to say? Yeah, come up here where they can see you. Woman of faith and power. You know, I love you, Pastor Rick. <laughs> I love you. I love to see what's that means she's going getting on. Ready to correct me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just love you. I love his heart. Uh, his, he wants truth, you know. And I really, I bear witness with what you're saying. We're going from an analytical yeah. knowledge to an experiential knowledge of God. Yeah. And I think I shared in Zoom Wednesday. I saw a um, man say, revelation. What is revelation? And it, it said, revelation um, 
by the evangelical Western world is a theology about God, at knowing about God. It was truths revealed about God. And this man said, revelation equals knowing God. And somebody said to me, well, that sound, the, the, the first one sounds better, knowing truths about God. And I said, wait a minute. Would you soon know me? Or like somebody to tell you about me? Right. Right. We're passing the time of yeah. the middleman. And you know, it's funny when somebody was talking about Bobby knowing the truth. Uh, that all of his questions are answered. I thought to myself, yeah, Bobby's got no middleman telling him anymore what God's like. He's face to face with him, amen? Oh, wow. And Jesus so many times said, you heard it said, but I say, and remember what but means? Disregard everything prior to what you're hearing. You've heard it said, but, I say unto you, and that tells me that what you heard ain't the truth. <laughs> Amen. And, and, you know, the scripture tells us to taste and see that God is good. Do you know? Taste is an experience. And what it's saying is that the experience comes before the perception. We get it backwards. We think, well, I'll see, then I'll believe. No, 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 no. You've got to experience it. And through your experience, your eyes are open to, wow, this is what that meant. And I find the last, ever since I've been yielding to the Holy Spirit, I'm experiencing life. And then the Holy Spirit gives me the scripture. And I go, oh, that's what that means. And so it's really doing life with the Holy Spirit, and he is just unveiling everything to us. And it's so beautiful. And really, it's, I've been reading Brennan Manning, mm -hmm. Abba's Child. That man had such a wonderful, wonderful heart. And it's all about love. Mm -hmm. And when you take 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, you know, love is this and love is that. Replace it with the word God. God is patient. God is kind. God is long-suffering. God doesn't keep account of the wrong. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That Well, that just, just screws up religion because, you know, if you don't get it straight, man, right. he, he's going to chew you up, spit you out. Amen. Mm -hmm. He don't keep account of any wrong. Because nope. love just covers. And it's all about love. Remember, it was uh, Paul to Timothy. The end of the commandment or the end of all instruction is love. Mm -hmm. That's what we're becoming love. Right. And that is just so beautiful. Jesus was so full of love uh, that he attracted the publicans and sinners, the kids. They all were all over him, man. Pharisees never had that effect on people. <laughs> they repelled people. Amen? And so you got to say, what, you know, my life, am I attracting people or am I pushing them away? Amen? It's just so good. Amen. Love is good. Yes. You know, a lot of the, the God that we have believed in a lot of religion has been the opposite of love. It's not it's not God. It's it's the opposite of love. So we, we know where that's coming from, right? I was just uh you said one word earlier, you said you're balking less at what the spirit is persuading your heart of. And it reminded me of that scripture where it says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in a lot of versions, that stops there. But in the King James, it says, 
it is hard to kick against the pricks, right? And, and we know we were in Costa Rica together and saw the ox-drawn carts coming out of the river and those pricks that it's talking about in that verse are actually, they're actually called goads. Yeah. And they hook to the harness of the ox and they're sharp prongs that actually stick into their butt, right? So when they're hauling their load, if they try to go backwards, they back right into those pricks. That's why it's hard to go against the pricks, right? Well, you know what the prick is for us? It's the Holy Spirit encouraging us to go on. Do not go back into your old behavior of trying to do this all on your own. Right? It's, it's saying, move on. I'm the one who will propel you. I'm the one who will give you the power to do whatever it is that needs to be done in this world for yourself or for others. And so, yeah, uh, I... If we balk less, then the Spirit comes in and says, let me do it. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Amen. Yeah, it's just like, you know, when you get to uh, taste and see that the Lord is good and you begin to experience the life of the Lord and then say one day you kind of get a little fleshly. It's like, oh, you know, it's like a different experience, right? <laughs> that's what I was thinking when, when he was sharing that. It's just like, that's, that's the mercy of the Lord. That's the love of God. He doesn't want you to feel good about death, right? Because you weren't created for it. You weren't created for it to walk in, in the, or looking to a life in the flesh. Our life is in him. Amen. That's it. Anybody else? Amen. Feel a sweet spirit here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Good to see Bob. Hey, Bob. I thought I was seeing an angel when you walked through the door. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. And again, Lord, we thank you for the gift, uh, in Bobby, that you gave to us. In Bobby, we know you're in his care and his presence and that he's in that place where he's praying for us, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, And we just thank you for the comfort of the Holy Spirit in all this and his family. Just comfort those close to him there's so many lives that he came in contact with and touched and uh let this just be turned around for good that that people would see you as you are your good good father that loves us and cares for us and just wants to pour everything you are into us lord god thank you for thank you for that again thank you for your word uh, the word of life that helps us to to grow up into you and looking to you, the one who loves us, the one who gives his life to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I love y'all.